Do you know when I was a kid, when I was, excuse me, when I was a kid, this was a rough time of year because I was always waiting for Christmas. Do you know how, you know, when you're in school, you know, you're waiting for school to let out and it takes forever for school to let out. 2.30 was high school and I think 3 o'clock was elementary school. You know, you know how it, when there's things coming up, you know, because like when you ask a kid how old they are, they'll say, well, I'm six going on. Because they're always anticipating the next going on, aren't they? I mean, no one, no one who's 59, which is what I was, I'm not going to say, well, I'm 59 going on 60. <laughs> right? But that waiting feeling is awful, isn't it? I don't know. I, I, think, I think one of the worst feelings in life is to to wait don't you think waiting is hard yeah yeah you unspiritual people you know what i'm talking about waiting is difficult we don't have patience for waiting well you didn't have to answer yes but i'm like that i hate wait i hate waiting in line i don't know about you folks but when you're walking in the store just pause please relax when you're walking in the store and you have your buggy or your shopping cart whatever you egg in here in maine do you look for the shortest line? We all do. It's like, hmm. And then, and then now that we have the self-serve, which I hate to do, I look for the few lanes that are open, and then I scan the buggies to try and figure out the length of time I'm going to have between. And then, I ha and then I have to commit to a lane. And then, you know, then you do the thing where you look at the people and you, you do the math and you see who's going ahead first. It's like, oh, I should have picked that lane. I should have picked that lane. I got the one here with the screaming child. Huh? I got to look back. I'm tall enough I can see through over all the stuff in the store. You know? Is there anybody that says I love to wait? Because nobody, nobody likes to wait. It's one of the worst feelings in life to wait. You know when that's the hardest though? When you're waiting on God. I think waiting on God is insanely difficult. I think you know what I'm talking about. Some of you right now, you may feel like you're waiting on God. You've prayed, and you've prayed for something, and you're wondering, God, why is it taking so long? Are you even listening? Have you forgotten me? Do you, do you, you, know, do you not even care? So, I mean, you might be praying for who knows what. Maybe you're praying that God would heal you from migraines. Hmm? Perhaps you're asking God to Bring a loved one to Christ. Boy, that's a big one. Hmm? You might be praying that God would give you a real job with real benefits to help provide for your family. That's huge. Especially if you're considered the provider. But honestly, who's the provider? Right? You may ask God to heal you of depression or to save your hurting marriage. I don't know. Or, or to bring you a spouse. Maybe some of you are asking for that. And yet... The more you pray, the less you see. And you wonder, where are you, God? I mean, you've been praying for a spouse for years. I know a story of a lady. She'd been praying for a spouse, and she had 43 specific requests for God. Okay? For God, just bring me a man with these 43 specific qualities. I didn't know a man could have 43 specific qualities. <laughs> But after a few years, you know what she did? She kind of whittled it down to two. I want him to be a man, and I want him to be employed. God, just bring me a guy with a job, okay? Some of you may feel like this. You've been praying, you've been begging, you've been waiting, you've been wondering, and you're believing, and you believe that God can, but you just know that he hasn't. And you've waited so long, you're starting to wonder if God even hears your prayers. And if he does, does he even care? And if he's even there at all? So what do you do when you've been waiting? Well, that's why the title of today's message is, Why is God making me wait? And I want to show you from the Word of God, which is those Bibles right in front of you, and hopefully you've brought your own. If you didn't, it's okay. We also place it on the screen. I'm going to show you what God is doing while we are waiting because you need to know this 
If you've ever felt like God is taking a long time, can I see your hands? Huh? Okay, I'm unspiritual that way. I think God takes forever. I don't know where you are. I don't know, God, why you don't do this thing that I'm asking. I mean, this is exactly what, though, what people felt like in the Bible when they were waiting for God Almighty to send a Savior to the world. Now, if you don't know the story, I want to walk you through it today, and it's really kind of cool. God promised to send us what was called the Messiah. What was the Messiah? He was a deliverer. He was to be the king of his people. That God would send a Savior to the world. God promised it would happen. And then, nothing. Nothing happened for decades after decades. In fact, centuries after centuries. In fact, I want to show you just how long God's people waited for this one promise. And all we have to do is go back to the beginning of the book, and that's in Genesis. Back in the beginning of it, in the garden. If you know the story, God created man, and he said, man's pretty good, but it's not good for him to be alone. Man, how many of you would agree you'd be pretty lonely without your wife? That's right, we would. Women, would you be okay without? No, well, I'm not going to ask that question. Okay. But you know what, guys? I'll tell you what. You can't find your socks. You can, you can open up the refrigerator and say, honey, where is And it's staring right at you, right? We need you. You complete us. We need your help. So what happened was, is God saw through all of this need that we have, and he said, you need help, Adam. And so he created Eve. Adam saw Eve, and he was like, whoa, right? He was. He, well, she, she was straight from the dust. She was pretty, no, she was from a rib. She was pretty, and God said, now you're good together. Be fruitful and multiply. Be blessed. Enjoy the garden. Just don't eat from that one specific tree, okay? Don't eat the fruit from that one tree. Now look, I'm not trying to forbid you from having fun. I'm trying to free your life for blessing. And Adam, I mean, and Eve gave in, and then Adam gave in right and they sinned and they were ashamed and god brought a covering to them which was made by animal skins clearly the first sacrifice and then there's a little weird verse you're going to find that maybe you've never noticed before to me it's huge i love it and it's there in genesis chapter 3 and it's an odd quirky little verse that many theologians and scholars say is the first prophecy that god would send a savior the messiah would come the verse that says the seed of a woman would crush the serpent's head. One day the seed, all through the lineage of Eve, would be born who would come, who would crush the serpent, the head of our spiritual enemy, and there would be victory. And death would be conquered, and hell would be conquered, and sin would be conquered, and we would have freedom. One day, it's prophesied that God would send a savior through the seed of a woman who would crush the serpent's head. Now, the serpent, of course, is the devil, right? <clears throat> Go all the way back to the third chapter of the Bible, and you'll find God promises and sends a savior. Then, centuries passed, and we could pick it up anywhere in the Old Testament, and I'm going to pick it up in the book of Isaiah. And this is 700 years, get it, 700 years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah prophesies in chapter 7, verse 14. And it's the very same verse you can read in Matthew, also in the New Testament, that was fulfilled in Matthew. The word says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. 700 years, miraculously before this event, Isaiah prophesies, and yet we had to wait. We had to wait. We had to wait, and we had to wait. We had to wait. And what is God doing while you're waiting? What is God doing when you're waiting? When you're praying for healing, for blessing, for reconciliation, for provision. Because right now it's 10 degrees outside, and I'm going to tell you right now, we have a lot of neighbors that are wondering where their heat's coming from. And you don't think there's people praying that haven't prayed before? And, and what do you ask? God, are you jacking with me? Huh? I mean, because he can. I mean, he could. I, he doesn't. 
is he cruel? Is he, is he being playful? Is he teasing me? Is God just wanting to show off? What in the world is God doing when he could do something and he's not doing it? And you're waiting. You know what I think? I think those are fair questions. Do you ever ask them? Believe me, I do. I do. I think it's okay to ask them. I, not, not accuse them, but ask them. Take real questions and take them before a real God who has real answers. I think that's fine. So what is God doing while we're waiting? Well, to try and answer that very important question, what I want to do is I want to show you a period of history that's not in the Bible. There's a period of history that's not recorded in the Bible, and it's called the intertestamental period, right? So let me explain to you what this is. There's a period of 400 years between the time when the Old Testament ended with Malachi, right? Or as I tell you, it's the Italian prophet, Malachi, okay? Malachi. And then you have the New, so the, the Old Testament ended with Malachi, and then you go 400 years before the New Testament is started with the book of Matthew. And so in between, you have the intertestamental period. Inter, in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's 400 years between the Old Testament and New Testament. So during this time, this, this 400 years, there was no word from the Lord. Nothing. No word from the Lord. The Lord didn't speak at all, which made things way more different and difficult for waiting on a savior see this is the purpose of being down here on the floor i can pick stuff up when we drop it can you imagine how hard it would be waiting on the lord when the lord is absolutely silent for 400 years think about just the length, the, the age of our our own country they were waiting on a savior but before the Old Testament was done, at least God was speaking. But now they had continued to wait, and they had heard nothing at all. So I'm guessing, I'm guessing maybe that some here kind of feel like that. You know, you're probably praying on something, having faith for something, believing for something, and yet you've got no word from God. You, you've got no sign that he heard you, no sign that he's active, no sign that he cares. And all you want is an answer. Ever been like, oh, give me a sign, God. Just I'm, give, me a, give me a feeling. Give me anything, anything. And yet some of you, there's nothing at all. Nothing. So what's God doing while we're waiting? Why, why does it seem like God is silent? Hmm? And what I want to remind you is just because God feeling is, it feels silent, Guys, he's not absent. So what is God doing while you're waiting? I want to show you today through God's word that while you're waiting, God is working. Hmm? While you're waiting, while you're wondering behind the scenes, the goodness of God, the power of God, the provision of God, the grace of God, he's always working, he's always working. He's, he's working in all things to bring about good. He loves you. He's a good father. He has plans for you. He has plans to bless you. He wants to prosper you. And just because you don't see it happening doesn't mean that he's not doing anything. So what is God doing while you're waiting? In your notes, God is always working, even while we're waiting. In fact, I want to show you a verse in the New Testament that gives us context, both towards God's timing and toward the event that we celebrate this season, the birth of Christ. And it's found in Galatians chapter 4 and 5. <clears throat> and the Apostle Paul says this, he says, But when the set time, somebody say set time. Thank you. Uh, those watching online, just put that in the chat. Set time. But when the set time had fully come, what did God do? In other words, in that perfect moment God sent his son born of a woman remember Genesis chapter 3 the seed of the woman born of a woman you know what it's interesting why does it say that born of a woman under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive 
sonship at the perfect time and the perfect moment when the time had fully come. God sent his son to purchase us as our sinful lifestyle and to redeem us with forgiveness and grace that we are no longer children to sin, but instead we are children of the Most High God. Our God did that in the perfect time. I love the, the Greek phrase there. The, the two words uh, translated uh, that we get this from, it means the word chronology, all right? It's kind of like a clock, and it means complete time. It's the full measure. It's the perfect time. Let me tell you how this phrase is translated by many different uh, Bible translations. One translator says, but when the time was right, God sent his son. Another version says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. Literally, this means, but when the time was fully pregnant. I love it. Why it, boy, the word pictures. Now, as someone who's watched his wife give birth a few times, I know what that means. In other words, when it's not time, you can't force it. And when it is time, you can't stop it. Amen? It's time. There's no time like it's time. And if it's not God's time, you can't make it happen. But when the time is fully right, there is no power on earth that can stop the will of God from coming forth. Nothing. But when the time was right, God sent his son born of a woman. Now, remember Genesis? <coughs> remember Genesis? We talked about that woman, uh, that the, about the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman. From the seed of the woman would come a savior who would crush the head of the serpent. Why does it sound bizarre to say that? I, I'm, and I, I'll tell you why I think it does. Everywhere else you look in scripture, everywhere, you'll find when they look at the biological seed it's always talking about the seed of man look at all the if you've got the old uh the king james version the, remember the the begats so and so begat so and so so and so begat so and so the who who comes from who it's always father son father son father son but the only time check this guys this is going to be a new revelation for some of you this is the only time you're gonna see the mention of the seed of a woman why is that because Jesus was born of a virgin. Of a virgin. He wasn't born from the seed of an earthly sinful man. Instead, how was he conceived? By the Holy Spirit. So his father was of divine nature, born of a virgin. Therefore, Jesus didn't inherit the sin nature that we inherited. He was born of the seed of the woman, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was perfect in every way. And that is why he could be our sacrifice. The innocent one. The, the Lamb of God, slain for the sins of the world. Forgiven. Us. That's how good our good God is. You see, at the perfect time, you see how Scripture ties it together? Jesus was born of a woman centuries past. People were waiting for the Savior. So when did God fulfill his promise and send the Messiah? The answer is... Just when the time was right, at the perfect moment, God sent his son. Now, looking back, we can see why God waited. Sometimes in hindsight, I don't know if you're like this, but for me, the more you wait, you see the why behind the wait. Ever been there? I know I'm going to talk to somebody here. Because right now, you don't see it. But years from now, you may look back and go, oh, wow. I'm so glad he didn't, or I'm so glad he did. Sometimes in hindsight, you can see the why behind the wait. When we look back, sometimes we can see exactly why God waited for the perfect time. His ways are always good. And just because God feels silent doesn't mean that he's absent. So whenever you're waiting, remember, our God is working. Now, back to that intertestamental period, that 400 years. How many of you love history? Can I see hands? Okay. I think some of you aren't telling the truth. All right, okay. All right. Man, I, I, I love history. I hated it when I was growing up, but brother, I love it now. And I want to give you a little history. If you just hang with me for a second, we're actually going somewhere with this. And what I want to do is I want to show you five of the most important things that God was doing 
during those 400 years. This is kind of neat. While everybody else was waiting, five important things happened. The first thing was, well, who ever heard of Alexander the Great? Do you guys know that name? All right. In 12 years, just 12 years, he conquered the entire world. Now, let me just give you a little secret. When you conquer the entire world, they put the name great by your name. Kind of goes with it, right? He doesn't just get a great parking spot. He's known as Alexander the Great. All right? I, I'm telling I guess today a lot of people would call him the GOAT. If you don't know what that means, that stands for greatest of all time. But that's done now if you just dunk a basketball or you throw a pass. But this guy, Alexander the Great, he conquered the world. They called him the Great. And why is this significant? Because this is the first time in history there was a common language. In those days, almost everyone spoke a little Greek because Alexander had conquered the world. The second really cool thing that happened during this time, the Old, tra the, uh, Old Testament was translated into what? Greek. And what was it called? The Subtuagent. Okay? I knew that. I just wanted you to give, I wanted to give you a moment to shine. No pressure at all. Felt good, didn't it? All right. The Old Testament was translated into Greek, which was now the known language in the world that everyone spoke. Previously, it was in Hebrew until about the year 280 or so B.C. So the Old Testament and all of its prophecies about the Messiah, they were translated into Greek. Now, the third thing you may have already heard of, the Socratic method. You ever heard of that? Hmm? This was a very new way of learning that emerged. And for the first time, instead of teaching just one way with communication, people were encouraged to ask questions. And they learned by asking instead of just hearing. Number four cool thing. In 63 BC, the Romans conquered the Greeks. And this was an un unusual and unprecedented season of peace. So when they're not making war, do you know what the, war the Romans did? They were building, they were developing, they developed roads and highways, transportation systems, and people could travel as they never could before. Stay with me, I'll get with you on this. It's really cool. And number five, there was this thing known as the diaspora, all right? And it was really weird. There was this season where the Jews were forbidden from living in Jerusalem, all right? And suddenly they were dispersed throughout the entire Roman world. Now look, when you add up all five of these things, you start to see the why behind the wait. God, where are you? What are you doing? What's up? What's going on? Where were you in that season of silence? Well, suddenly, 400 years, when those people wonder where God was and what he was doing, suddenly, everyone, for the first time, could read the Bible in a language they understood. For the first time, they were not only allowed but encouraged to ask questions about God to get to, an, get to an answer about who Jesus was. And out of nowhere, for the first time in history of the world, good news of a Savior could travel through common language and across roads and highways through a Jewish people that were spread throughout the entire Roman world to the Gentiles and then beyond. In other words, in other words while God's people were waiting, God was working. And in the same way that you're praying and you're wondering and you're hoping and you're asking and you're wanting, God is still working. He's always working behind the scenes. I believe he is. How many of you believe he is? Okay, good. Maybe you're exactly in one area of my life. Maybe you feel like you're in a holding pattern. Have you ever been that? You're, you're waiting, you're believing, you're doing everything you know how to do, trusting in God who says he can, but he hasn't. And you might be wondering, do you ever internalize it? What did I do wrong? Huh? Have I failed? Where, what, what's my lack of faith? Is there sin in my life? Have I let God down? Does he, do, does he not care about me? Huh? I mean, I know I'm a screw-up, but am I such a screw-up that he won't even deal with me anymore? If you're waiting, you're not alone. Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years to hold their baby Isaac. 25 years. Joseph had a vision to rule, to lead, to influence, to save. He waited 13 years, much of it in prison for a crime he did not commit. The woman with the issue of blood, how many years? 12 years. 
12 years in private agony, unable to function like a normal woman, held up relationally, interpersonally, interpersonally and spiritually. She was unclean. 12 years to touch the hem of a garment of the one who said your faith has healed you. A man who couldn't walk for 38 years. 38, 38 years. Unable to walk before Jesus looked at him and said, pick up your mat and take it home on your own two feet. You're healed. While you're waiting, while you're waiting right now and don't see anything, God is working. While you're hoping and while you're wondering, God is, God is waiting. I hope someone hears that. You will hear this and internalize it, that God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. Just because he hasn't, that doesn't mean that he's not going to. Maybe it's just not the right time yet. In other words, while you're waiting on it, I don't know what it could be for you, all right, but some of you are waiting on it. You're waiting for an answer. You're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. You're waiting on the miracle. You're waiting on the provision. You're waiting on the relationship. Whatever it is, maybe the reason you're waiting is because it isn't ready yet, whatever it is you're waiting for. God's still working on it, right? And you still may be waiting on it, and I'll tell you right now, God may be working on it. He might. Our God may not be working on it because it may not be ready. But you, you may not be ready. What do you mean by that? Ever have a kid ask for a Christmas present you knew wasn't age appropriate? Right? Sure, you'd give it to him, but it wasn't the right time. Huh? Maybe God's waiting for you to get ready. Maybe he's doing something in you. Maybe he is doing something in you. Maybe you prayed and you believed. You know, I'd, I'd be married one day and you're still single. God's doing something in you. Maybe you're married and you're wondering, God, why don't you hear my prayer? Why don't you bring healing in my marriage? You're believing for a job that's going to meet the needs that you have in a way that really your education and your preparation is worthy of. Or you're like me. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're just like me. You're in a holding zone. And you're waiting and you're praying and you're believing and you're begging that God's going to draw my kids and grandkids closer to him. It's kind of funny. You know, when you hit 60 years old, you start receiving more mail about retirement. You do. And many people think about what they want to do with their retirement fund. You know, with the money they've saved. Well, I'll tell you right now, I'd give it all and everything else if I just knew that my family was going to join me in heaven and worship the king for eternity. I'd give it all away. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. Talk about, talk about a change of priorities when you know your children or your grandchildren haven't met them yet. So while you're waiting, can I tell you, God is working. He may be working on it. He may be working on you because you may not be ready yet. I'll tell you what I've found. I have found that God will often do something in you before he does something for you. Okay? He does something in you before he does something for you. You're waiting. You're watching. You're watching. You're waiting. You're waiting. You're waiting. You're waiting. Can I tell you something about the waiting? Don't waste the waiting. Don't waste the waiting. Maybe God, you know what? Maybe what God is doing is he's teaching you to depend on him in a way that you never have before. Maybe he's revealing his faithfulness to you in a way that you couldn't experience any other way. And maybe he's teaching you patience. Maybe you made a mistake a long time ago, praying for patience. There it is. He's teaching you. He's making you patient. Maybe he's knocking something off of you. He's chipping away at the sin in you. Could that be it? Maybe he's conforming you to the image of his son. Maybe it's not ready, or maybe you're not ready. Whatever's going on, don't waste the waiting. Understand where you're at. This is a God time. Don't waste the waiting. 
Learn to depend upon him like never before. Maybe he's drawing you close to get to know him in a way that you wouldn't have known otherwise. So don't waste the waiting. I love what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 64, verse 4. He says, since ancient times, no one has heard. No ear has perceived. Listen to me. No one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has ever seen any besides any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait on him. When you wait on God, he acts on your behalf. When you wait on God, he moves on behalf of you. He responds, he listens, he interrupts, he initiates. But no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no one's even conceived the goodness, the power, the grace, the glory of God who acts on behalf of those who wait on him. That's how good our good God is. Amen? Because God's ways are always good. And you don't have to agree with me, but I know it's true that his timing is always perfect. And I know that you can trust him. And he's not ignoring you. And he hasn't forgotten you. And if he sent his son to the cross for you, can I tell you that he loves you? He cares about you, and he's always good. Our God knows the cries of our hearts. Because he, you know, just because he feels silent doesn't mean that he's absent. What's he doing? What's he doing while you're asking? While you're hoping and you're waiting and you're begging and you're praying and you're waiting? While you're waiting, our good and powerful, all-loving, all-knowing God, he is working. He's working. And years from now, when you look back, you may see why the wait was worth it. Huh? It's incredibly interesting to me that Christianity is unique among all the world's religions. Did you know that when you think about it? Every other religious system, people pursue their version of God. Think about it. Any other religious system, you try to win the favor of God through good works. You try to win the love of God through religious rituals. You try to perform your way to his pleasure. If you're good, you gain favor. If you're bad, you lose favor. You look at every other system of religion in the world, and people try to, to work their way to God. They pursue God. But Christianity is different. It's so different. Because we serve a God who loves you so much, he pursues us. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not worth pursuing, but he sees it some other way. We serve a God who pursues us. And just when the time was right, just when the time had fully come, when the moment was perfect, God sent his son, his one and only son. God pursued you. He sent Jesus, not for the righteous, but for the sinners, right? For the broken. He sent Jesus, not for those who are already healthy, but for those of us who are sick. He sent Jesus, full of grace, full of truth. He sent Jesus, the Son who sets people free. We serve a God who pursues us. And maybe the God you're waiting for, well, what if he's actually pursuing you? Think about it. Stay with me. I love the promises of God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, our God, is, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but our God wants everyone to come to repentance. So our God is patient. Our God is patient. The same way he's patient with me, maybe he's being patient with you because he wants everyone to come to the, the knowledge of, of his goodness, his love, his mercy, and his grace. He is patient. So what if the God you're waiting for is actually waiting on you? What if at this moment he's wanting you to say yes to him? Because hmm? we're waiting for him to say yes to us. But if we say yes to him, he's right there. If you're hurting, if you're waiting, believe me, I understand. I've been praying for a long time and continue to believe, but I still haven't seen the answer the provision, the miracle, the healing from God that I believe I will see. But with everything in me, I believe his timing is perfect. I believe that it's, he's always good. And I believe that while I'm waiting, I believe that while you're waiting, our God is still working. You got it? 
All right, let's pray. <coughs> let's bow our heads just for a moment. So, Father, today, do a, a work in a way that only you can do. We ask for you to work, God, even as we're waiting. And as you're reflecting today, those of you that would say, yeah, yeah, there's, there's something I'm waiting for. There's a prayer that feels unanswered. There's a miracle that you're hoping to come. There's a provision that you've not yet seen. There's a healing or restoration that you're continuing to wait upon God to bring about. Now, if you find yourself waiting and you want God to have his way, to do his will while you're waiting, if that's you, I'm raising my hand right now because I, I know what I need. If that's you, just lift your hands right now. Lift them up. And in a moment of surrender before God, I thank you that there's nothing wasted. You're always bringing about good. So in a season when we really don't understand, God, build our faith, deepen our trust in you, draw us closer to you, God, than maybe than we've ever been before. Help us to fully trust your character and your nature and your goodness. And God, to continue to wait, believing in faith, God, that we just can believe you can, whatever it is. We believe that you will. God, and even if you don't, we still believe. We still believe, God. Now, for those of you who are waiting right now, could you just comfort them, Lord? Help us to put our faith in you, that you're still working, God. We trust you. We trust you, and we believe by faith, God, that at the perfect time, at the right moment, you will do your perfect will on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for watching online. We'll see you next week. God bless you. Oh.